The DJI Spark is small and light enough that taking it on a cycling trip on Prince Edward Island or a hike out onto the craggy cliffs of Newfoundland isn't an issue. That makes this a flexible and useful airborne camera for just about everything. Combine the fun of flying with its ability to take photos and video, this gets shots that surprise and amaze. My review unit came with the propeller guards, the remote controller, an extra battery and battery charging station, as well as a carry bag. That's the Fly More kit, which I would highly recommend. The aircraft and controller come already paired. The controller's arms extend to hold a cell phone, and all I had to do was connect the phone to the controller's ad hoc Wi-Fi to get up and flying. And then launch the DJI app and tap on Start Flight. Although it works fine without it, there are a number of calibrations that can be performed to align the compass and other components. Wait for GPS confirmation and the announcement that the home point has been recorded. The home point has been updated. Please check it on the map. Even if you've not flown a drone before, it's easy to get started. DJI has a helpful set of video tutorials. Once the spark is off the ground, it hovers in place when you release the controls. A few months ago, Lighthake sent me a drone landing pad, which proved to be very useful as the spark has very little underside clearance. We didn't fly without it, and I also think it helps the visual coordination system. The app screen includes the camera view, heads-up display with height, distance, and speed across the bottom, and distance warnings in a colored semicircle. There's a compass direction circle, bottom left. Across the top, the remaining flight time. Camera settings are an optional display. They appear top right. And there are multiple touch controls to access features and adjust settings. There are buttons to take off and land in the top left, Confirm, and the spark takes off and hovers about a meter off the ground. There's a similar confirmation when landing. Press the red button to start recording. Length of the recording displays below the record button. There's a camera flip toggle to switch between stills and video. In stills mode, the shutter button is white. The spark stays pretty level in flight, and the dual axis gimbal keeps the shot smooth and steady. There are two gimbal modes, level and first person. In first person view, the camera banks left and right as the aircraft turns. Once up in the air, the images from the 12 megapixel camera and the 1080 HD video will delight you with new views of familiar scenes and locations. The remote control makes flight operations easy to master, forwards, backwards, left and right on the right stick, up, down and around on the left and the spark moves smoothly in response to most of these commands. Spinning the spark around isn't as smooth as the others, and the tilt feature, accessed using a dial on the back of the controller, is also less smooth. Press the screen until a blue circle appears. This can be used to turn and tilt. It moves fairly slowly, about 10 kilometers per hour, particularly forwards and backwards. Maximum vertical speed is 3 meters per second, according to the manual. That's also about 10 kilometers per hour. There's a switch on the controller to activate the speedier sport mode, up to 50 kilometers. In addition to faster speed, the joysticks react more quickly, and flight is slightly less smooth. The gimbal can't maintain a level orientation. The rotors may appear in the shot. Faster speed also requires a longer braking distance. Maximum transmission distance between the controller and the aircraft is 2 kilometers, but that's considerably more than Transport Canada's height and distance limits. I set the height limit at 90 meters as required. And as the spark is small, it disappears from view quickly. The limits require me to be able to see the unit, so I set the distance at 500 meters. And it is a fair weather device. In Newfoundland, there were days where either wind or precipitation kept the spark on the ground. It just didn't seem smart to fly if the winds were higher than its rated maximum speed. And although it does occasionally warn of high winds, it didn't seem to have trouble when it did. 
It's rated for 0 to 40 degrees Celsius. Transport Canada limits non-commercial craft to daylight operation. But that did not prevent me from using the Spark for the things it does best, a drone group selfie and a large overhead vista. Did I mention the recordings are silent? It makes sense, after all, all you'd record is propeller noise, but it is a limitation to consider. Tripod mode is the opposite of sport. It limits speed for a very smooth pan or tracking shot, and the controls are less responsive. I tried it indoors, but it's going to take some practice to master smooth shots while avoiding walls. I found the Android app flaky. On one phone it wouldn't go past the connection screen, on the other it frequently quit to the home screen and had to be restarted. It also frequently lost connection, usually only for a short period. These screen recordings are from an iPad, which seemed considerably more reliable. The camera's field of view is similar to a 25mm lens on a 35mm camera, and the lens opens to f2.6. The sensor is similar to those found in inexpensive point-and-shoots. Camera controls are limited. Switch out of auto mode to set ISO and shutter speed, and in the absence of an ND filter, the shutter speed is fairly high in sunny weather. Most of these shots were taken in auto mode, but I did use EV adjustments as required. Video is recorded at 30 frames in MP4 files with H.264 compression, data rate about 25 megabits per second. There are several still modes, single, multiple, which takes a three image burst, exposure bracket, a timer, panorama with three settings, and shallow focus. Panorama has three versions, horizontal, vertical, and 180. In 180, the Spark takes 21 images, watch the progress under the shutter button. When it's done, enter review mode to let the app stitch the images together. For a higher res version, you can create the composite yourself from the individual images saved on the micro SD card. For shallow focus images, enter review mode, tap to select the subject, and use the slider to select the amount of background defocus. There are a variety of autopilot modes, and I suggest you get familiar and comfortable with manual flight before you use the autopilot, and practice switching back to manual control from the auto mode. You may spot obstacles or problems in time to prevent an autopilot accident. The most powerful and useful auto flight is return to home, and it can be invoked using a key on the remote or a button on the app. The spark returns at an altitude set in the app and then slowly descends. The camera returns to level and the orientation reverts to its takeoff position. In return to home, the camera tilt can't be adjusted, so footage is rarely usable. Return to home is also automatically activated when the battery reaches a predetermined level or when the signal from the remote control is lost. Pressing the key on the remote will cancel return to home if you see obstacles or the unit appears to be disoriented. Always best to start a flight where the sky above and around is clear for that return to home mode. Return to home mode works, but accuracy is less than I expected. Kim was frequently moving the pad to catch the spark. Although it lands within a few meters, that could be disastrous near water. Other auto modes fall into several groups of automated behaviors. DJI calls them intelligent flight modes. The spark can be set to follow. Set it at eye height, select trace for front and back, profile for side. It can follow from behind, which works well, but your subject can't be too small or too close and the camera can't be too low. Profile mode follows from the side. When backward flying is enabled, the spark can also follow from the front, backing up, but in every attempt, after a few seconds, it swiveled around to follow from behind instead. If you see trouble, the flight pause button can be used to exit all of the automated flight modes. There are four preset shot patterns, quick shots. There's the classic drone selfie, where it backs up and away, or rocket, which goes straight up while facing down. Circle flies around the subject, 
helix flies a circle with an expanding radius. For each of these presets, the spark takes the shot and then returns, although in multiple attempts the drony mode did not actually return. I'm sure you've already seen others demonstrate the hand gestures with varying degrees of success. Mm, I enlisted up. Kim to assist as I read now. through the manual. It did take us some time Over. to learn them, but we found they do work as advertised. First, enable advanced gesture controls using the app. Hold the spark and turn it on while it's facing you. Wait until the tail lights flash yellow, then tap the power button twice for a couple of beeps and it will take off. The manual does recommend the propeller guards while using hand gestures. Even with them on, we both managed to get stung. Hold up your hand to activate palm control, which can be used to send the aircraft back and forth, as well as up and down. Taking a selfie proved to be a little more difficult. Finding the right hand gesture to make the front LEDs blink red took yeah. a few tries, but we did get better at it, and when we checked, there were more images than we thought okay. it had taken. When you're done, the spark will land on your hand, approach it from the underside, and it comes softly down. The app maintains a flight record that shows the flight path and includes a low-res video and image store on the device. And there's an auto-edit feature, which creates a compilation of your day's shots. DJI has reduced not only the size and weight, but also other features, and I've resisted the temptation to continually remind you of that during this review. But in comparison to the Mavic or Phantom, this is a substantially lesser device. Battery life, sensor size, video resolution, camera controls, all are better on the larger models. Those could potentially be used for professional photography. I would not put the Spark in the same class. But with lower expectations, it can be useful and fun for personal projects. Although there is value to be had with the Spark, the limited flying time, about 10 minutes, can be a challenge. I found that by the time I had it up in the air and established the shot and the move, about two shots was all I could manage before the low battery warning started. The Fly More kit includes a charger, which can charge three batteries simultaneously, takes less than two hours. It also charges the remote controller. Its charge lasts longer. The Spark comes in a styrofoam container, which is great for storage, but has no carrying handle. The Fly More kit includes a case, but it's not really big enough to hold the aircraft, particularly when the propeller guards are mounted. There's no underestimating the thrill of flying or taking photos and videos from the air, but it can be nerve wracking, particularly when you consider all of the things that could go wrong. And Canada, like other jurisdictions, has rules and regulations to keep you safe which limit the times and locations where you can fly, even for non-commercial use. Comments and questions below? Thanks for watching. Well, since you've decided to stick around to see what happens, here's what happens. I'd originally planned to review both the Spark and the GoPro Karma, but the Karma was DOA when it arrived. The controller complained that it couldn't find the stabilizer. So I reset and reseated it several times. I tried it in the grip, where it worked fine. And I did try to get through to GoPro support, which is only offered in real time via phone or online chat. And the chat is only available for 12 hours, like the phone support. And every time I attempted it, I was not able to connect. It says that agents are helping other customers and to try again later. No email option. Now, there is a toll-free phone line from Canada, and after 10 minutes and ads for the GoPro Enhanced Support option, GoPro revealed that wait time was three hours. I took the callback option. I got a callback within an hour, 40 minutes later. After trying all of the agent's suggestions, we concluded that the unit was DOA and should be returned to the retailer. I did check both the GoPro website and Google.
but this is not an issue that's being discussed online. However, there's one interesting thing that happened. Early on, I got confused and ended up emailing DJI's support. And know what? They sent me a link for the GoPro software update site along with screenshots of the update process. So, thumbs up for DJI support, thumbs down for GoPro.